Okay, so Dr. Matten, uh, we're in crazy times right now. First off, how are you doing right now, and how's life for the Mattens? Uh, a little different than normal, but uh, otherwise doing very well, Zeb. Nice to talk with you. Yeah, good to talk to you too, man. But uh, obviously the circumstances are pretty pretty tough right now. Um, first off, how many kids do you have? How many boys do you have? How many Matten boys are there? Uh, I have four boys. Four, four boys. boys. Yep. we got Drew. Cole. Yeah, Drew's, 20, Drew, Drew's uh, third year up at Michigan, University of Michigan. Cole's uh, just finishing up his freshman year up at Michigan. Uh, Zach just uh, is a junior right now, and Adam is a seventh grader. Okay, so um, three of the four boys, Adam's a, he's a seventh grader. He's in middle school. He hasn't had a chance to wrestle, but three of the four boys and yourself have been state champs for Delta over there in Northwest Ohio, correct? Correct. Okay. You were actually Delta's first state champ. Zach's the last, right? Yeah, so, yes, I was the first state champ for about an hour and a half. So it was a benefit of being a lightweight compared to the big boy. Who was Robson. it, Rob, Rob Sintobin? Yeah, Rob Sintobin was about an hour and a half later. Okay, so, yeah, the two great families, that the, the big family names, obviously, out in Delta are Sintobin and Matten. I mean, there's more. There's more. How many other uh, siblings have won state titles at uh, Delta besides – well, those are it's yeah two two siblings for uh, Rob and Adam have won and then Troy won for St. Tobin's. Yeah. How many how many of them? Troy's a cousin and uh, and then I think that's it. I don't think there's any other siblings that have won uh, multiple state titles or state titles as family in Delta. Okay, so those are the two big families I like to and, and people I really like actually. Um, I like Adam St. Tobin and Rob, good guys. Um, great family, great family. So okay, um. Obviously, you are a doctor. Where do you work? Where What is your job title, and where are you working? Where, what is your Where are you at right now? Sure, I'm an emergency medicine physician, and I'm the I work primarily at Toledo Hospital. Our group covers seven hospitals within the Northwest Ohio area, and we work also up in Monroe, Michigan. Uh, I'm the medical director at Toledo Hospital Emergency Department, um, so I'm uh, I work half clinical and half administrative. So that's kind of my job. Okay. And as you know, as I was talking to you earlier uh, off camera, you've been, you haven't been as swamped as I thought you would be because right now you took this time off for what you and I thought two events you and I go to. You as a as a as a dad and a fan, I as a media guy. Last week at, at state tournament, Zach won his district at Napoleon and was on track to win another state title. I felt like, and then um, you were heading out to Minneapolis with uh, with your boys, right? Yeah, so, you know, this is kind of, for wrestling fans, this is kind of like the Super Bowl time of year. So <clears throat> last weekend, we figured we'd be at the Ohio State uh, High School State Tournament. And then this weekend, Adam had his junior high state tournament. And um, so, and uh, we obviously loved to, to go to the Minneapolis and see the NCAA. So we're trying to figure out logistically how to fit that all in and then come to find out we don't attend any of that. So. That's crazy, man. Um, and we're gonna obviously get into the medical end of it, but you know I got to talk wrestling with you, right? Like, you know, you know that's a big part of what we do here. But uh, how did Cole do at Big Tens? Um, he was 141 pounds for uh, University of Michigan this year. How did Cole do at Big Tens? Because here, here's the crazy thing: I, I interviewed Zach after uh, after uh, Napoleon after he won. He had a fall in the finals. You weren't there, and I was like, "Where's your dad?" And if, in a typical Mike Matt and Road Warrior format. You left Friday night from Napoleon, probably went to Detroit, and then you flew to, to probably either Newark or wherever you flew. What was your what was your route? And you went obviously and you went and watched the Big Tens from the district, right? Sure. So I, you know, the plan was to uh, get Zach through the semifinals at district. And so I stayed through um, the semis at districts and he was Oh, you left Saturday morning. Oh yeah, I went Saturday morning. Uh, he wrestled at he wrestled at eleven fifteen. I jumped in the car, uh, got up to uh, Detroit around one. Uh, caught a flight at two o'clock um, from Detroit to LaGuardia. Um, then rented a car um, from LaGuardia, drove to Rutgers. Um, Cole wrestled at six thirty. I think I arrived at six fifteen at Rutgers. Got the ticket and sat down. He gave me a quick hug and ran on the mat. So it was a uh, it was a busy weekend. So uh, you do this a lot, though. I don't think a lot of people understand. You actually do this like that is a very I call that a very Mike Matten thing. 
uh, saving lives, road warrioring, air warrior, whatever you do, like you do a lot, man. It, it's kind of crazy. We'll get into the life saving, but how did Cole do at the, the, the Big Ten? Well, he didn't do quite as well as he want, it wanted to. He lost his first match um, to Phileas from Purdue um, and dropped him in the Concies. And uh, he had his uh, – basically his placement match was then to uh, wrestle the Duncan boy from Illinois, who's a three-time cha- national qualifier. Um, Russell Gray tied up the match with like six seconds left and then uh, gave up the reversal kind of at the buzzer to, uh, to not place. So they, in the Big Ten, you know, they, they have eight, had eight allocations – and uh, he, they do, uh, once the kids, all the kids that are out, he ended up winning two matches the next day to finish ninth place as the alternate. But uh, so he was just, uh, just out of qualifying, and uh, which was, I know, very heartbreaking for him, uh, but a, definitely a learning experience uh, for the for a true freshman season. So, And in the Big Ten, obviously, with how the, big, the, the, the dual schedule goes, that Friday-Sunday thing, I mean, he learned a lot this year that, that obviously – Drew already knows about the Big Ten and the Friday Sunday schedule. It is a grind, man. It is a grind. January and February in the Big Ten is is not for the faint of heart, and literally only you know under hundred people do it super effectively, right? Like if you think about it, it's it's such yeah. a grind. You just get you get chewed up and spit out. And for a true freshman to do that and then to be there to qualify at the end is is pretty good. So do you want to say hi real quick? Come on, no. Okay, Ferdinand just ran in the room like a wild feral animal and then ran out. <laughs> okay, well, I can't really. Yeah, I know you know. You told you already gave me the 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 tip. You said as soon as you start getting outnumbered, you're in trouble, Zeb. So we stopped. We're done at we're done at two here. We're not going to go for the outnumbering situation. Where you're you're, you're four on two. With, yeah, you're four on two, and you get outnumbered, and that that's that's when the kids really start to to rule the roost a little bit, Mike. I know. Yeah. I know you think you're busy when they're when they're young with the four, and then you realize that when they're older and you have college and high school and junior high, and you want to be there as a as a good parent and be supportive. It definitely uh, challenges the planning and the navigating the travel and such. But uh, you know it, it's all good. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Okay, Drew redshirted this year. Drew Matt and redshirted this year for Michigan, um, and they're coming back with a, a, a. I mean, it's not it's a gold or a silver trophy team in my opinion. Um, it's an unbelievable team. Two Olympians are going to be on the team next year. Um, they're really loading up for for a title run next year at Michigan. There, I don't think there's any doubt about it. Yeah, they they have an amazing, uh, t- talented team and a lot of potential and a lot of proven guys. And I think there's a lot of excitement about you know uh, the folk, the team next year. And I know that Coach Bormet, great leader, great program. Um, they're doing all the right things, and uh, so I know that they're itching to get back like all like all the programs itching to get back to work and uh you know get back at it okay so uh did was zach undefeated this year he was yeah he, he was. won the medina First. he had a crazy match with crosby where he yeah. got thrown on his dome and somehow won the match on rides on a ride in the third period um so he had some he had some tough waters to navigate to be undefeated this year he went to some tough tournaments uh, mommy Bay won Mommy Bay, beat Moon and Mommy Bay in a barn burner. You know, the number one guy in Division One. So so he had a great season. How did Adam do? Adam did, had a great year, you know. Uh, he, so he was undefeated on the year and uh, had a nice year. Been wrestling well and kind of making gains uh, the way I'd hoped he'd be. And uh, he's he's getting that itch to be to be hopefully wants to be special and he's starting to act like it and behave like it and do the things you need to do to be special uh, behind the scenes and uh, which is good. So I think that it was nice that he put in the extra work this year and the results kind of seemed to parlay into that. So it's funny how when you work harder, uh, you get better results. I actually know how Adam feels. I'm the youngest of four boys and my three older brothers were state champs and then I wasn't a state champ. Um, so that, that was obviously tough, you know, for a couple of years, but when I went into college, and got into college, you know, and I was able to have a, um, I, I, I don't know, <laughs> I had a college career. I don't know if it was super successful, but, you know, I had a college career and placed in the Mid-American Conference a couple of times, was alternate for the NCAA tournament, essentially in what position uh, Cole's in right now. Uh, you know, it's like, it's tough, but, you know, life goes on. Life goes on. Like a lot of these kids, life's going to go on. Life's going to go on. I, I think we're in this extraordinary situation, Mike. What do you say to Zach Matton right now? What do you say to him? Because they're they're having the press conference today. 
the OHSA is going to have the press conference where they're going to cancel, right? Absolutely. We're, yeah, they're going to I mean, cancel. they have to. You know, we're, and that's, yep. what, that's what we're going to talk about next. What do, you, what do you say to your boys about this? What do you say to, um, you know, is is uh, Adam going to have his OEC tournament? We don't know that, right? Like, But the OHSA is probably canceled, right? Yeah, yeah. So that was, a you know, last week when I got that on Thursday, I, I heard uh, – I saw it on the uh, social media that uh, they're canceling it. And I, you know, I didn't want Zach to hear that at, uh, on his own. So I drove up to actually to the school to have that conversation. And just cause I didn't want him to hear it. Cause I, you know, all the kids work really hard. Um, you know, so to break that to him was a pretty emotional time for him. And uh, it was pretty hard. Uh, you know, he just kept asking, you know, why, you know, I've done everything right. And, you know, that's, that's, you know, I've, I've done the extra work. I'm, um, I'm ready to roll. Uh, I deserve a chance to, re- to repeat a state champ. And, you know, obviously you don't have the answers, right. As a dad, you, you know, you felt terrible for him cause you know, the, the work that you put, you put in. And, uh, but so yeah, it was a tough conversation that I'm sure a lot of kids, the emotions were raw and it was a, it was a rough afternoon. You know, so you got to assure him, hey, man, this isn't your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. And, and right. it's for all the athletes, though. It's the 330 right. NCAA athletes. It's the, jeez, uh, oh, Pete's. We got 16 at 14 weight classes times three divisions. I mean. Yeah, <laughs> you know, 600 kids, hopefully, or so. Yeah, hundreds of kids. I mean, it's it, it's mind-blowing to think about it. So, uh you know, let's just talk about the meat and potatoes of what I want to talk to you about, though. Like, this is a serious health risk. COVID-19 is a respiratory, uh, it's a virus, respiratory infection, correct? Yeah, it's part of the corona, coronavirus. It's one of the coronaviruses, yes. Okay. And this particular one uh, originated in Wuhan, China, correct? Yes. And, um, and they're, they're saying it was the wet markets, right, where they, they have live animals. Well, they're, yeah, that, that's what they're kind of uh, attributing it to. I mean, basically, it's a novel virus. And what they mean by that, it's a virus that has not been, uh, we haven't been exposed to before. And that's what's causing the, the problems. Um, you know, we've not seen it. It's new. Um, and so that's kind of why it's wreaking havoc because the body, nobody has any antibodies, or the, which is basically the ability to fight that um, virus. Um, so your body, it's new to everybody. So... This is almost like Christopher Columbus and the the Spaniards coming over in 1492, and that is like essentially they were bringing things with them from the Eastern Hemisphere that Native Americans had never seen, and what I honestly what ravaged Native American cultures is. Listen, I want to feel like I like I know something here. That's what yeah. that's what ravaged Native American cultures. They had no immunities to the smallpox, influenza, anything that the 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 Asians, the Europeans, or the Africans brought with them to North and South America, right? That that's essentially yeah. what's happening. Yep, yeah, great analogy. Great analogy. So so that's the deal. Um, okay, Ferdinand, good job. We we've got that little picture. All right, here you want to sit in here for a little bit? Okay. So so we, they have we just we don't have any immunities to it right now. Our big um, so everybody is at risk. But the biggest risk factor and the people that we're really trying to save would be your 65 and older because their immune systems would be weaker. Is that, am I correct in that? Well, yeah, I mean, as, as we get a more advanced in age, you know, you're, you're definitely have more comorbidities, meaning you have other medical issues going on and you're not able to fight it. It does appear that this virus per se, um, you know, while it's transmitted to everybody, it seems to be hitting our elderly population the hardest. So when you look at the mortality rates, meaning who dies, who gets really sick, anybody more than 60 years old, uh, it seems like the numbers show that that's going up significantly, at least when you look in Italy and, and uh, in Wuhan, uh, in China, what they dealt with. And that's the, we have to go off their models, and the problem with going off their models is they're, they're not big on sharing information. Yeah. Uh, well, it, yeah. I mean, China isn't, you know, obviously is open. Um, there's been a lot of data shared with Italy and, and now that, you know, in, in uh, Washington, uh, we're learning a lot and we're getting a lot of information, uh, you know, what worked, what didn't work, um, what things, you know, the, the bigger, the, a lot of this is you don't know what you don't know. And so, you, you know, when more people go through it, you, you can kind of get prepared for some of the things you don't know you need to be ready for. 
you know, I, I don't, I want to talk about it. Like I, I like to learn things from you. So I like to have you tell me things. It feels like I have like, like a, a layman's grip on it. I feel is what I have. Like it's basically a layman's grip on it. You know, like, um, the quarantine and the self quarantine and the social distancing, tell me about the curve and flattening the curve. And, and, and the, they're, they're basically telling us four models right now. They're showing us four basic curve models, right? They're showing the, the massive Everest spike model curve that they're showing us. And they're showing us three other scenarios. Tell us about the curves that they're presenting to us and how we reduce the curve. I saw you on a Twitter post, all gloved up, glasses, face shield, everything. You were covered. Everything was covered. Tell us about flattening the curve and what the curve is. Sure. So what you'd like to think about it is, uh, you know, if, if we did nothing and we just, uh, you know, went about our daily lives, then we'd have a massive spike with people getting infected. And if you look at the data, and again, I'm by no means an absolute expert on this. I, you know, I, so take this with a grain of salt. You know, I, I'm educated on it. I feel comfortable talking about it. But, you know, so you get the, you get a massive number of people get infected, about 80 percent. So 80 out of 100 are going to do just fine. They're going to walk around. They have a cold. They have mild symptoms. Um, then you have about 15% that would you would describe is get sick. You'd say like when you get the flu, okay, you feel terrible, you're kind of down and out. And then you have about 4% that get really sick. And those are the people that get, you know, life support and or won't make it. So you would have a massive influx of uh, that. It would just uh, spike and it would overwhelm the hospital system because the hospital system, you know, we only have so many supplies when you think of ventilators, when you think of just supplies in general, beds, uh, rooms. Um, and so we operate, you know, all hospitals operate at a pretty full level. And so they could not handle uh, the ability to handle the, the massive volume of uh, patients that would be coming in. So the plan, so the goal of that social distancing and quarantining is to help and lengthen the time that we may be exposed to, or that we have the the virus out there. But it, but the numbers of sick patients that we de that we're developing are low enough that we can keep them, we can get them better, get them out of the hospital, and then we take the next wave of patients that are sick. And, and so that's why it's important to flatten that curve. So you want to, the same number of people are going to get sick, but we can take care of them more because we have the capacity uh, over time to deal with them, but we just don't have the capacity to deal with them all at the same time. So Terrell Delagnev said to me, he goes, if you ask 330 of those athletes, he said probably 300 of them are going to want to go and they're going to go wrestle at the NCAA tournament. We get that, right? With no fans and they could have been in the gigantic arena. Um, would those effects been ca uh, cataclysmic, do you think? If, if you got no fans, no fans, uh, massive arena, just the kids wrestle. Yeah, I mean, obviously a lot of factors at play there. I think that they did the right thing. Um, as painful as that is for me, you know what type of fan I am for the sport and then for the kids, and I know exactly what the people are putting into this and the coaches and the programs and how important it is to them. Um, but I do think it's the right thing to do, um, you know, to see, you know, to hear some of the stories, what they're dealing with in Italy and to hear what they're dealing with out in Washington. And uh, it, it's 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 a very scary time and it's it was the right thing to do i'm i'm fully convinced of that now as painful as that is to say it's the right thing to do okay so say we go we we go we go this we do this we do nothing we go here we're good. ohio's been the model for it by the way uh mike dewine has been the he's been at the forefront of this uh, love him or hate him i don't care about that he's the model for all the other states and what people are doing um, right so we have the 40,000 fans. We, uh, we do, we go, we do the state tournament. Are those effects, are those effects cataclysmic? What, what, what's your projection there? We don't, we act, we do, we, we go business as usual. Do you feel like how bad would that have been? 
You know, the potential is tremendous. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, we don't have the ability to test at the level we want to, we being the United States. And so you have all these people that are out there that definitely have uh, COVID-19. Right now, there's just uh, there's hundreds, if not millions of people that have it. Um, and then if you put them, all, you know, bring them from all over the country, put them in the same unit, and then spread out, uh, you know, then, you, you know, it's, it's, then they each, everybody, they, they get, then they get in contact with their family and friends and it just spreads those models in the Washington Post were, were very telling and a very uh, good representation. So yes, I think that the potential was there. You know, we, two of my doctors went to an ER conference in New York city. Um, one of those uh, six of those doctors have already tested positive oh from that mild conference. And, uh, you know, we, you know, so it's a real thing um, that when you bring people from across the country together and then they start spreading it and then they go back to where they are, then it just spread, multiplies over and over again. Mike, what would your medical advice to Tom Miller, my dad? My dad has a pacemaker. My dad has type <clears throat> 2 diabetes. He's actually in amazing shape for all these horrible things I'm telling you about him. Um, what would you have said to him? He's 71. What would you sure. have said to him about going to the Ohio State tournament? What would you have said to him? So it was just the four, the four for each wrestler. He was going to be one of my nephew, Wyatt. He was going to be one of his four. What would you have said to him? Yeah, I would have said, uh, you know, I talked to your dad actually at Maumee Bay. I believe I saw him there. Or I saw him recently, one of the tournaments. I can't remember which one. But uh, I, I tell him, you know, he needs to stay at home. And he needs to not go out. He needs to not go to the grocery store. He needs to rely on his family and friends to uh, do that. I think he, not, he just needs to not go to church. And these are the same conversations that I had with my mother-in-law, with my parents, with my grandparents. And, you know, I stopped over my grandparents, stayed more than six feet away, talked to them about because they went to church last week. And I kind of gave them grief over that and, uh, you know, tried to explain to them why it's so real and what uh, needs to be done and volunteered our services to go get them groceries, drop it off in their front porch and just need to stay inside and stay away from everybody for, you know, 14 days at minimum and, and go from there. The, what is the incubation period for it and what are we seeing? Because I know that it's novel, it's new. That's what that means. It's almost like a novelty. That I think that that's actually what, you, what you're doing with when you call it novel, right? Yeah. Because it's yeah. new. It's new. We don't know well, anything about it. But yeah. you know 100 times more than the average Joe Bag of Donuts knows. You, you know a lot, yeah. Mike. Um what is our incubation period? You know, what, what are some things that maybe our media is not telling us that we don't know about this? Well, I mean, I think, you know, with a big novel, there's a lot of things we don't know in general. What it appears that we are uh, contagious before we have symptoms, which is not good, right? When you're, you're spreading it when you feel fine. Um, and you, even after you recover from your symptoms, it appears you're still shedding virus. And so they're not too sure of the time frame, but they feel confident from everything I've read and talked to that uh, you are spreading it from, you know, you can get symptoms is from two days after exposure to, you know, over 14 to 20 days later. So there's a long period of time where you can share and spread the disease. Okay. What is your projections right now? What do you guys see as far as projections when you look at, uh, I'm here in July, August, man. I'm here and we're going to be in this situation until July, August. Would you say that's an extreme model? What are what are you guys talking about right now? What, what are your kind of the models you guys are being shared with? Yeah, to be honest with you, Zab, we're working day to day, right? We're working through problems in a, in a moment by moment basis. And I can tell you that, you know, I'm sure that uh, our, my hospital system is no different than any hospital system across the state of Ohio and across the country um, that, you know, you're planning for, you're not planning for three months or six months. You're literally trying to get things up and running for the next day. Um, things are changing. The amount of energy and resources that are being put towards this at the system level, I think would it be, uh, if everybody knew the amount of time and energy that people are in the hospital system or a healthcare system is putting towards this, they'd be very impressed. Uh, you know, people are taking this extraordinarily serious. And to be honest, we haven't even thought three months out or six months out. We're thinking literally, 
you know, today? What can we do today to not only protect um, uh, our patients, um, but we also need to think we need to protect our healthcare workers um, because without our healthcare workers, we can't take care of our patients. And so you, you're trying to, trying to get the message out on what people can do to help because um, I think we all have a role. And, um, you know, that that's kind of where we're at. So I, I do think it's probably going to be a long time. You know, um, I think that they're working hard trying to develop vaccines. Um, they're working hard on trials for treatment. However, you know, viral treatment has never been, you know, that uh, beneficial. But, uh, you know, what we can do, that, you know, little things we can do to help once you do get infected. But ultimately, the answer is going to be a vaccine. And that's probably well over a year out still. Wow, we're over a year out for a vaccine, you think? Well, I think they're developed. Um, from what I heard, I read an article today that I, I think that there are uh, some, they're doing tests on people. People have been injected. They're, you know, there are some people that have received a vaccine already. Um, but like any vaccine that you're going to give to millions and millions of people, you need to do the, the research to look at the long-term uh, ramifications of that um, vaccine. So I do know they're developed. I do know they've been given to humans, um, and I think they're tracking them and monitoring it and, and stuff. And that's you know that's way above my pay grade as far as um, where they're at with that. But yeah, it's going to be a long time. Are the stores and things like that madness? You're in a small town, right? And I'm in an, uh, you know I'm in an urban area, suburban area of Cleveland. Um, is it is it madness over there at Delta? Uh, uh, do you guys have? I don't know. Do you have a uh, do you have a grocery store in town? Is it bare? What's it like there? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we do have a grocery store. It's a small town, but we do have one grocery store. Um, you know, it's like anywhere, you know, some things you, you just can't get, right? The toilet papers of the world, they're they're very hard to get. Um, which <laughs> what is that? What is that? Tell me what that is. Do you know what that is? I don't know what that is. I have no idea. Um, so no clue about that. But um, so, yeah, I, the, the grocery stores have been doing a great job. And those workers, you know, I, I would say we went one day and there was hardly any meat. Went the next day, it was full. So we've still been able to get supplies as we need it. You know, I think that, you know, a lot of people are very nervous and very scared, which is understandable but you know you need to keep things in perspective and uh we can't panic right you can't panic you know we just have to you know can't buy you know ten thousand pounds of meat you just you know buy what you need for a couple of weeks and, and go from there um have you seen any of the videos circulating on the internet of like their internet they're interviewing people on the beaches who are like oh this is ruining our spring break we're still partying have you seen any of those yeah, videos? I did. I saw a couple of those. And, you know, I, I try to keep things in perspective, right? You know, when I think when I was 19, 20 years old, you know, I didn't under have perspective in life and I didn't experience the things that I've done now as a, as a 47 year old man um, in the healthcare world. So I don't really take it personal, but it makes me sad that the message quite is, isn't quite out there as much as we want it to be. And I think young people in general feel they're invincible and uh, you know, that to, to alter that mindset is it takes time and it takes some real conversations. And so, yeah, it's disappointing, but I think that, uh, you know, that slowly that message is, I think the vast majority of people understand and are getting the message out and understanding that message, which is, you know, that everybody's got a job to do. Have you let the Matten boys know they are not invincible? Have you let them know? Do they know that? Well, they, yes, yeah, so they, they definitely know that. So, you know, Drew and Cole, they were up in Ann Arbor and they got home and, you know, I, I say, well, you guys, you know, they're like, well, when are we going to, when can we go back? And I said, what do you mean when you go back? You're, you're not going back for until we, you know, and they said, well, why? And I said, because, you know, they're typical 19, 20 year olds. They want to hang out with their friends that are in, in, still in Ann Arbor and such. So, um, so yeah, we've had some real conversations here and I think they get it more than most, right? They see what I do for a living and the consequences of, you know, they, you know, they don't want me to get sick and I don't think they want anybody to get sick. So maybe they understand it a little better than most. So they have a pretty good grip on it and they're intelligent and they're pre-medicine. Two of them are pre-medicine, right? Yes. Pre-dental, pre, -dental, pre I, it's medicine to me. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Cool wants to be an orthodontist and Drew's and uh, pre-med. Mike, I was raised by an iron worker who was raised by an iron worker. So you got to understand where I'm coming from here when I say these things to you. Uh, you know, they, they didn't know a whole lot about anything when it came to the medical field. Um, rub some dirt on it and get tougher, I think, was a lot of the stuff that they would tell us. Um, 
You know what sure. I mean? Like, so we're talking, you know, very different, you know, like we wouldn't have known anything about this. We would have had no clue. And we'd have been at the mercy of, um, someone, a good person like you telling us, Hey, th this is for real. This is that you need to understand. This is for real. Um, are, are we, uh, are we in the uh, lockdown? Are we going to lock things down? Are you going to be one of the only people moving? You truck drivers? Are you? Are we? Are we at that level? I think we're at that level, aren't we? Well, I'm not. I'm definitely not in the know, but I. I would. It wouldn't surprise me if we get to that lockdown level for a couple of weeks. Um, I, I wouldn't. You know, obviously, everything Dewine has been on the forefront on um, making some really hard decisions. You know, and uh, but you know, if 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 those decisions save lives uh, and and do what we think they're going to do, uh, the, and keep the hospitals open and not from you know from keep their head above water, then I. I so yes, I think the answer is ultimately going to be there's going to be some version of that. We're already there. Um, um, are they going to shut down flights? Are they going to shut down everything? It would not surprise me at all. Um, if you look at Italy, you look at China. Um, first off, let's just talk uh, China. The way that chi China is five to one to us. The, uh -huh. They're, they're 1.4 billion people. We're 329 million. 320, we're, point, we're, one, we're one fifth of them, right? We're one sure. fifth essentially. Um, most of them live in apartments with shared air circulation sy systems. Um but they don't have any civil liberties. They don't have due process of the law. It's very simple for them to lock people down and tell people, hey, you're not doing this. Americans don't, we don't operate like that. If you've seen some of the spring break footage where kids are like, ah, we're not going to get this. Even if we do, we'll be sick for a little bit. We need to party through this. Americans are a different beast from Italians and the Chinese. We're very different. Do you think right. that that's something that's almost our enemy? We're, we're really free. We're really, 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 really free. And nobody's ever seen this. My dad's never seen this. You know what I mean? His dad lived through World War II, my, my papa Ferd. But we've never seen this, and it's unprecedented. Are we our own worst enemy when it comes to the, our freedoms that we have almost? You know, that's a great question, Zab. And I would say that we are, but I think we're, you know, we have a lot of smart people. And I think that um, if we keep getting the message out and we keep uh, holding people accountable uh, for their actions, um, then I think that, that you know, I'm, I'm confident. I, you know, what I see, I mean, our uh, volume in the emergency department, what I, you know, the message has been out there, right? Don't come to the emergency department unless you absolutely need it. People are listening. Our volumes are actually down overall in the emergency departments, and that's a great thing. It allows us to take care of the patients that need us. It allows us to uh, decrease the exposure. Um, so I've seen a lot of great collaboration. I've seen a uh, I, so that freedom is a bad thing, but it's a but it is. There's some positives as well. We're educated. You know, I think that we have the ability. To, you know, we have the free access to the, to all the information. And uh, you know, so I'm optimistic more than pessimistic that we can uh, make some real positive. Uh, you know, it changes uh, in behavior. And I think that if we all hold each other accountable uh, for the, our own actions and for the, what the appropriate actions are, then I think that message gets out there a little bit sooner and, and, and we can be okay. Give me your top five, top three. Give me a list of what people absolutely need to be doing right now. You've reiterated it in the interview several times, but right now I mean, people need to hear things two and three, four or five times before they memorize something. What are the sure. top things that Dr. Mike Manton says that what are the essential things we must do right now to get through this and what do people have to do to stay healthy and, and safe? Yeah, great question. So number one, you know, if you're over 60, uh, you literally need to shut it down completely, you know, get people to go get you things. Um, you know, don't be going to church. Don't be going to meetings. Uh, just stay inside and stay healthy um you know what you can do on a daily level is wash your hands repeatedly um don't shake hands you know um multiple studies that show that shaking hands is just a bad idea i think that um you know so repeatedly wipe down things in your house door handles uh, surfaces much more than you typically would avoid going out um as, as much as possible if you do need to go out go out in non-busy times. So when you're going to the grocery store, go in the early morning or late at night. So you're going to avoid people as much as you can. And if you are around people, keep that six feet, you know, keep that six feet apart from each other. And uh, yeah, that's about it. So stay home, wash your hands, stay away from people. And if you do have to go out, try to stay with uh, greater than six feet away from people. Is it a good strategy to act like you already have it? 
Is that a good strategy? Well, like you don't want yeah, to I mean, it. Yeah. You know, that's kind of one of the biggest things I wish we had is, you know, from the testing perspective, I think people, you know, when we look in the mirror and talk about this, when you look in the mirror and you wake up in the morning, you look at the mirror and say, I don't have it. Right. So maybe I don't need to follow these rules. If we have the ability to test people and uh, tell them that they are positive, I think it hits home a lot more real. And so that I'm looking forward to the day when we can have what we call point of care testing and point of care meaning I can order it in the emergency department. I draw a little bit of blood. I run the test literally in the emergency department and get you those answers. And I know that's out there. It's coming. It's not coming as fast as everybody would like it, but I know people are working really hard to make it happen. Um, but, uh, so yeah. What is a typical conversation like on a daily basis with the Mattins? You guys are spending tons of time with one another right now. I'm spending tons of time with my kids right now. We're doing a lot of hiking. I own property. I know you own property. Um, you know, I'm cutting trees. I'm feeding the fire. I'm doing all types of stuff. We're hiking. What's the typical day like in the Manton house right now? What, and what are these conversations like? Are you talking about the news a lot? You obviously want to keep them not, uh, it, you want to keep them in the know, but you want to, you don't want to keep them paranoid and scared, right? Like what are your daily conversations like with your sons and your wife? Yeah. So it's, Try not to watch a lot of news, to be honest with you. I find it a little bit depressing, um, and I don't think it really adds value. I think it just creates more panic uh, a lot of times, and at least my own personal opinion. Uh, but you want to be in the know, but not be in the know too much, you know, and you're not sure what's real and what's not real. Um, but for me, you know, obviously my, my youngest two are on spring break, so the older two, they're trying to keep uh, their life as normal as possible. They're, you know, doing they're having their tutors online, they're having their classes online. So uh, trying to operate as uh, business as usual. Got up, I went for a run this morning, um, you know, by myself and uh, trying to do those kind of things and just trying to keep people busy, right? You know, you want to, we've got a nice project list that we're trying to get through uh, just to kind of operate as business as usual, but we're staying home. So you're off right now, but you're not off at all. No, no, I've had already a meeting, <laughs> oh, meeting man. morning home, and I have meetings this afternoon and in calls. Uh, you know, we're, we've you know re totally redesigned our emergency department so we can separate out any patient that is. We can cohort them in a, in an area that, that keeps them separate from everybody else. We have a separate waiting room for these type of patients, and, and so. Again, the amount of energy and resources, and, and uh, it makes me proud uh, to be a healthcare provider because these people are working so hard and uh, to make people safe and to do the right thing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been a very, it's, it's a super scary time, but watching how at least uh, the emergency department and the hospital has managed this, uh, you know, I don't sense fear from the healthcare workers other than I think they probably are afraid of a little bit of infecting their family right? Their family didn't sign up for this. Um, you know, they did. And, uh, but the amount of collaboration and teamwork and, and stuff has been really great to see. Okay. So as soon as this all breaks and hopefully it breaks, and I think you and I are both anticipating a break in the next three to six <coughs> months, right? It'll be summertime. Mike Matten's a maniac. Will we see you try and go anywhere like this or, you know, I got my Denali bug. I've been there. Yeah, so my I, it's funny. Um, just applied uh, to go uh, with my dad and uh, all my boys. Uh, Going to go hike Mount Whitney um, out west. So we just applied for the permit for that. So hopefully, you know, this fall or this I guess it's in August we're going to plan on going and trying to help hike Mount Whitney and then trying to set up a guys week uh, guys weekend where we can go hike the uh, Devil's Devil's Trail in in New York, uh, part of the Appalachian Trail. I heard it's a 25 mile rough hike that uh, we'd like to do so those are kind of on the bucket list for this summer that whitney hike first off whitney's the highest mountain in the lower 48 um yep. whitney my cousin don just did it and i gave him uh, one of my headlamps and uh, i have a, a headlamp and it's got a it, it becomes a lantern actually it'll light like a illuminate a large area he did it yep. he had no problem but, you know obviously it's a, it's a high 14 but i guess it's real gradual is what i've heard yeah, my dad did it actually last year on, on his own, and he wants to go back and take uh, take us and, and the boys. So we're going to try to do that. Um, you know, that it's, it, I've heard it's doable in a day, so get up early. Whitney's go and doable in a day? Back. I didn't know that. Is it doable? In the, well, I know that you yeah. maniacs will do it in a day, but like for regular people, is it doable in a day? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, I think it's a tw- uh, 12 to 16 hour day. So it's That's a long day, bad, but it's doable. Yeah, because I've done, I've done um, Adams. Uh, I've done the one in New Hampshire, Mount Washington, which is easy. Um, it's like a 6,000 footer. And then um, St. Helens a bunch of times. Yeah, I've done a couple. And then Ian and I did uh, all the Burroughs Mountains that are around uh, uh, one in Washington. Rainier. Rainier. Yeah. So I'm actually going to do Pride Pikes Peak again this summer. I'm heading out to Colorado with my nephew. We're going to go to Air Force Academy and go visit School of the Mines in northern Colorado. But, yeah. Are you going to be able to wake a Matten boy up and get me a Matten boy after this? Am I going to be able to I talk have, to a Matten boy? Yeah. I have a couple of them around here. I see Zach right in front of me if you want to talk to him real quick. Yeah, let me uh, – let me uh, actually, I am going to uh, – I'm going to cut our interview, and then I'll, I'll begin with Zach, and we'll get off camera and talk with him a little bit, okay? All right. Awesome. Hey, great. Hey, man. Thanks, Zach. Is there anything else you got for me before we cut this? You know, thanks for what you do. I mean, obviously, you're great for the wrestling community, and we appreciate it. And, you know, trying to get this information out about what's going on, answer some simple questions, and uh, I appreciate you. Is thanks. there anything on COVID-19 that I didn't cover or didn't ask or something I didn't I was that I missed badly on that you can correct me on? Because I'm all right well, with that. No, not at all. You know, I think the last thing is, you know, if your symptoms are mild, you know, uh, call your doctor's office. Uh, you, we want you to stay away, right? Um, if you get sick and you need to come to the hospital, you know, we're there for you. Um, as testing becomes more available, I know we we literally developed two pop. There's two drive up testings now in Toledo area, just in, through the Promedica system, and which has been a um, it, it's that's a big project to set up, and they do that did that very quickly, and it was very impressive. And they're starting to test people right from the doc from home. The doctors write the order, they send. Them right through the drive-through testing, um, and the more availability we get to testing, the more that's going to expand, and that, uh, it's going to be real helpful. But you know, uh, try to keep everything in perspective. You know, we got a lot of good in this world. It's, we're going to get through this. Um, just got to again do the right things, hold each other accountable, and uh, we're going to get through it. Okay, Mike. Thanks for the time. I'm going to cut this live interview. Okay, and then uh, I, I just appreciate your time, man. And uh, stick around here afterwards, all right? All right. Will do.